So, good morning. Welcome to our panel discussion on Clint Eastwood's documenting and archiving fandom and yeah. things about the show. Oh, I'm a little half prepared for here. Uh, and we're on for uh, uh, briefly John Thorne, a uh, long time uh, editor and writer in Rapid Plastic for 75 issues. He has several books. Vidi, uh, Gidera, how do I, do I get it? Gidera, I'm sorry. How many years ago? Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 12 Rainbow Trout on Instagram, uh, and he also writes for Stephen Blog and Stephen Miller with the Peace Blog. Um, uh, I wanted to have a discussion with these three folks because uh, capturing and documenting things about the show and the fandom is important to me. Uh, and in particular, uh, if any of you haven't made it over to the Stumpali Valley Historical Museum, please make time to do that this weekend. Uh, you will see over there uh, long-term, uh, uh, long uh, elements from the TV show production, rep uh, re reproductions of paperwork from that. You will see actual props that were used in the show that were brought by Vinny, uh, actual prop brought by Jason Matson, replica props. Uh, Vinny and I and Jason Matson all have things in there. Uh, John and I walked through, and John had, uh, since I have a bunch of the same things, uh, Stephen is a long time donor to the museum. Uh, but that's sort of an interesting lens to sort of think about um, uh, how do we talk about ourselves, and how do we think about ourselves, and how do we document ourselves and share uh, with others. Um, and so I probably have to sort of generic question for us if we want to keep it in mind. Uh, but one question for the three of you and, and myself as well is um, uh, what inspires you to capture and document and share? What what is the magic in that for any of you who would be very popular? Um, I'll start, I guess. So I, uh, along with uh, a good friend of mine, Craig Miller, who sadly has passed away, we started managing the Plastic in 1992. And we have to basically uh, express our uh, fandom uh, and appreciation uh, between these. And, you know, we were just doing it for fun. But it was after we, like, four or five issues in, and we were starting to interview actors from the show, we were starting to gather production material from the show, that I realized we're documenting it. We're actually kind of capturing the history of how this came to be, what it was like to be on the set, and what the, um, essentially the influence of the show was going forward. So, uh, I, I said to Craig at one point, we're, we're documenting to enjoy kind of creating something that hopefully will have some significance later on for people who are research. So um, it, it transformed into a more serious endeavor as we went along. Uh, I guess I represent the people who find it later on. Uh, I didn't want to say we had three generations of our kind of but we sort of do. I mean, uh, I was a toddler when St. Pete's aired, and so I caught it a little bit later in life. Um, but no, when I when I did find the show, it was sort of in this dead zone where uh, it wasn't effectively being talked about as much. The return hadn't been noticed yet. Uh, but as far as my fan experience went, uh, there were magazines like Grass and Plastics that kept that alive for so long and, uh, you know, added layers to the show uh, beyond what was on the screen and uh, just really contributed to the longevity of, of the fan experience. And, uh, you know, Rapid Plastic and, and sites like Kempik's blog uh, finding things like that just kind of made me want to uh, contribute to that experience for the next person. Um, and I, yeah, it's, it's also just no matter when you find it, you were finding it at, at a point in time. And there is going to be the next generation of fans, and uh, the further we get from the actual production, the harder it's going to be to track down those specific uh, uh, points in history where, you know, one business might not be there from one year to the next, and it's fun to kind of track where it goes over time, uh, and whoever joins it next is going to have a more complete picture uh, than maybe you have. In many ways, I guess, uh, inspired. Me being a fan from the 90s, so particularly Bravo TV, when it was on like that. I missed the first one. I was in high school, and I still was a senior. Uh, in many ways, we're like bookhouse boys. <laughs> Where there are men before us, and there were men before us. So, John, your work on graphic plastic 
I'm sorry, I'm coming in and writing letters to her and republishing the clips that are by sitting on a piano with you, right? Yep, yep. On this. But, but then I think of other sites, uh, Travis and Brad and Charles and Twin Peaks, just the thrill that we had finding those things and then trying to then connect it to. So then, you know, the other piece that would probably inspire me is things like Antiques Roadshow <laughs> or the History Channel or things like that where you want to understand the history of something. Yes. And being able to capture it and to give a more full picture. Uh, and particularly here in, in the real quick piece, because 35 years of history. Yes. 35 years is a long time, three and a half decades, you know. So being able to connect that to the real places that are here and understand the context of the show and, and the locations that they are um, was, was important to me. And I think you're right, it's, it's out of the word line. You know, I'm going to have to try to get my son to watch it. He's watched the first five episodes. As if you know, he's 18, so he's not like his father who was obsessive and, you know, had <laughs> nine and a half hour marathons. But, but, but nevertheless, if one day he, you know, I need somebody to continue the blog after him. <laughs> and so maybe, maybe, you know, but, but again, I think it is, it is helping you enrich the stories to go to the link the um, finding it better than you left it, right? So we found it at a point. And we we were there for things that were there at that time, but maybe not it won't be. I mean, I think it's even the first in the street. Mm -hmm. And how I remember seeing it uh, yeah. at Old Lolly State Park, but it's fallen over. So it's a different point of time. So we have documentation when it's there, and now we have a different. It's still there, but it's in a different state. Yeah, I think you've teed, you've teed up a bit about what sort of my current motivation is. So I I even grew up here. I moved here in 2008, and at that point. You're still like you go on MapQuest and print out pieces of paper, right? Like we're in the early smartphone era. So I get the keys to my house in Stepalmy, 2008, and that first weekend, I'm trying to go hit filming sites, and I'm just using internet resources, and I couldn't find certain things. Uh, the sign spot for me was hard for about a month until I finally found the right road. Um, and so, my how I watch the show since I moved here has changed because now I pay careful attention to the parts of the show that were filmed here. Because it's it's some of its history here. Things like the Visual Soundtrack Laser Disc is a document of the history here. Uh, and for me, it's sort of all the stuff starts to come together. Because we have things like again, if you haven't been over to the museum yet, uh, the the pilot has the scene with the Dale cells where where the three the three young men end up in jail and they bark and. Uh, that is filmed over at the upstairs at the building across from Tweeds. And part of those, these were not metal bars, it was actually wood, it's painted wood. And part of that sat there for years. It was still, part of it was still up in that room when I moved to the place. And it disappeared a few years later, and it was always, where was it? Where was it? Well, this year, part of it turned up at, it was at the Valley Stage, it was donated to a local theater, and it's now at the museum right now. Um, and so that sort of was one of the things that we lose it, and we hope to find it again. Um, and so part of what then drives it for me is how do we, how do I help provide resources for people who want to come here to know where to go, to see the things, uh, to you know get away from that MapQuest area. You, like I was working on trying to build a, a, a tourism site and we took care of it and I'm like, great, done. I don't have to do this anymore. I, I can focus on other things. Um, but I build off of different things, which I disappeared. Said, and, and, and you know, Charles went on to do his other things and yeah, you know, and so having that through the Wayback Machine, you can still find pieces, but being able to expand upon his work and give a little more context on the history of the yeah. stand in not just here but California and other sites that you um, because again, I think it's 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 the places and we were talking this the other day. This is this is a character. Yeah. This place here, the, the locations and so you got Cobb and Blackland who came to the event, which is awesome. It's Agent yep. Cooper and it's yep. an iconic and, character. And he says he says, I never actually drove down that road and all the school. Correct. They they turned left at the intersection. <laughs> exactly. We know. Uh, yeah. But but it's a these are these are places and there's in and there's there's other fandoms. You know, we were talking Star Trek and Space 1989, but you can't go to the moon uh, yet, maybe one day. Uh, but you can't go to the moon and, and visit uh, Moon Base Alpha, but you can come here to the Real Twin Peaks and be able to immerse yourself in these places that you see on, on a television. And the unique thing about this area is how much of this area was used throughout the history from 1989 all the way through to 2015. They were up here periodically shooting, and they shot so many different locations. You know, I think of like 
the Breaking Bad house that's in New Mexico and they had to shut the street down because so many the parents. But it was just that one place they were going to, that house. So let me get a picture of myself in front of that house. When you come here and there's dozens of places that you can go to for free that are critical. I mean, you walk in to tweet, you walk in to the double. They left it last day, had rebound. That alone sure. isn't worth it, but you get to go to the fall. You were just standing at the fall. And even if it wasn't associated between peaks, it's one of the most beautiful spots. Um, everyone is kind of overwhelmed when they first go there. I'm here in the fall. And then there's so many other things. There's yeah. so many other wonderful places. And I would call back for those of you who attended the Unwrapped discussion yesterday on the missing pieces. We spent a few hours going through the missing pieces bits by bit. And I. I had called Stephen out without calling him out by name because there's a, a scene in there of Laura and the truck driver, and there is still a debate about whether it was filmed here or in California. Um, and it's one of those things of uh, Josh says, yes, but we, we have the sheet of, of the schedule for the shooting. That's, that's our answer. And Stephen says, we have to go look at the, the roads and the, and the trees and actually figure out what it was. And that's one of those things where I've never been somebody who captured uh, the production documents. It's not one of my particular passions. But I can see as you and Josh are debating, like you were debating off mic while it was We're playing the film, and Josh, they're still debating this. We're still um, showing the ad. Yeah. like, but look at the tree. And yeah, but I, but I can see how that's one of those things of these production documents that the people who made the show are dying off. Some of the stuff is not being saved. But saving some of this stuff can actually help, even for me, then, because I can help answer a fan question of where to go. Where to go to see it? And I think it's important when you talk about archiving. And by the way, I'm a political science by my degree. I have a minor in public relations. You know, I spend most of my time probably in PR doing you know, things. But archiving is interesting. And I, I would love to deal in facts. I'm a Virgo, so that could be the reason why. Uh, but sources and having well sourced information. Because over time, people remember things the way they think they remember them, but not necessarily actually as they happen. That's a great point. Uh, we conducted a number of interviews with the actors shortly after the show we finished. This was in 93, 94, 95. It was really interesting to watch some, to, to listen to some of their interviews in 2015, 2016, and they're remembering it differently. And I, I think when we interviewed them, it was fresher in their minds. They were a little less guarded. They didn't have some of the studio the production team managing them and those interviews I think are extremely valuable you, you get to closer to what closer to really source. happened yeah, exactly yeah. and so um, I'm, I'm happy we were able to do that that early and, you know and finding you know for, for us newspapers.com is a great resource you know and it's interesting if you think about the evolution of newspapers how there was a time when there were so many you know now they really just you know they've been scaled down they merged they get rid of them but that site has so much history. And going through and like finding things like, I didn't realize the pilot you know, was at the Palm Springs International Film Festival. They showed it you know, in January of 1990, long before it, you know, a couple months before it airs. You know, other film festival circuits, Miami and Telluride, and, you know, just it, uh, even in the theater they, they had the, the title show. I didn't know that. And how many years I've been a fan of that, and it was all in papers, the we didn't use paper articles or you know, documented stories. Not a lot of photos, unfortunately, but we don't have the phone. We have phones in here to film. The film was expensive, and you had my exactly the video camera that's you know, it's a, so so you just have these recordings, but at least it's a source, and it's yeah. something you can point back to that it happened yes. in some way. And that having that documentation is, is, is critical. Probably, probably do. Well, you know, that's uh, again to keep people, sending people to the museum. Um, the, there's lots of paper stuff at the museum exhibit right now that are that come from a pair of boxes that were handed down to me uh, via some previous organizers of the Twin Peaks back in the day. Amanda Hicks had these boxes of paper, and she passed them down to me. They're passed them to Mary Hutter. Mary passed them to me when she moved away, and, and the museum brought about one box worth of stuff. Uh, and in there is a scrapbook where someone has cut out every single Twin Peaks related article and gone through. And I haven't cataloged it, but I know there are lots of newspapers, but they're not on newspaper.com yet. And there's probably stuff in there that can be used to you that I need to go through and figure out what it is. Um, and, and, and for 
Brittany was here, I don't know if Brittany's still here, but um, uh, one of the pandemic hobbies that uh, Beck and Kevin at the theater had was they got, because the Valley Record is not currently online and searchable, they got the giant books and went through, we're trying to rebuild the history of the Markman Theater by looking at the old physical newspapers. Um, uh, so, so it's like, yeah, we lose these things, we have to figure out if we recover them or not. Lost in time, you know, and I find that everything that's happened before happens again in newspapers. It's like, sometimes you repeat history, we just don't remember it, you know? Yeah. But it's, it's interesting to see the, the sources. And when we were doing stuff about the props, and looking at the, the, the problem about it. And that's where the antiques roadshow then comes in for me because I want to know, like, so what is this plate? Tell me, Betty. You know, and you, you, you can get into it. Manufactured by this person and such. Um, and that way, if someone wants to find it and want to have one for their own collection, you've had that happen. I have. Uh, yeah. Um, identifying that's been a on the screen and tracing them back to the manufacturer and basically figuring out how to rebuild uh, what you physically see on screen and compete is a really fun quest and to have several people who share hobbies like that the more of us do that work uh, those angles and archives can kind of be triangulated to find a more complete picture uh, of Twin Peaks. Yeah, agreed. It, it's funny, we, we know we made it big time when people on eBay are calling certain props that aren't really, I mean, they're replica, they yeah, identified them, but they call like these you know, Tahitian mugs or used in the sheriff's station, and uh, they call them a Twin Peaks prod. Because if you search the article, it pulls up the first thing is the article. Uh, yeah. the blog about it's only a matter of five before so that coffee crap comes out. It's a Twin Peaks yeah. prop. It's not yeah. you know? <laughs> one that's in the, the sheriff's area. Yeah. 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 I have that. Yeah. That's one of my favorites. Oh, yeah, me too. Yeah. 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 It, is, it is really funny when, uh, you know, we trace something back from Twin Peaks to the real world. And uh, the the general public's takeaway from that is, oh, it was in Twin Peaks. Like, yeah, I know, that was our like starting point. Uh, there, was a, there was a postcard in Jacques Renaud's apartment. Uh, you have the scene of a trooper holding a donut and a little bit of the cover, and he's down the down on all these postcards inside the cover. Uh, one of them is a postcard of uh, three men with painted, or two or three men with painted bellies. Uh, and I was like, okay, I just gotta get to the bottom of this. Uh, and I, I ended up finding the source of the photo was taken with the NPR Good Times Parade in the Bay Area in California. Uh, where Frank Silva is from. Uh, and I don't know if he had any influence on whether or not that was uh, used in the set dressing. It's possible, but um, you know, tracing it back to that point of origin uh, was fun and, and kind of opens up things to think about. Uh, but then I see one on eBay, and the listing is postcard, KNBR, Good Times Parade, Twin Peaks prop with a link to my article. Like, I know. <laughs> I think one other thing I would call out is uh, for the people on the show, we, we always think of the people who work on the show, if we put them on a pedestal and, and they know what they were doing was special. Sometimes it was just a job. It's just a job. They didn't save, they didn't save this stuff. Uh, and so like I think about uh, Jason chair over at the museum, which is used in season three. Uh, Jason figured out the right bedroom chair. He found an antique. He reupholstered it. They didn't have access to a chair for season three. They reached out and said, Who, do people have stuff like this? They borrowed Jason's chair, they reupholstered it, and he doesn't know what fabric they used. And he's emailed back with the production people, and they're like, yeah, it's somewhere in the emails, but I don't have it. Like, like, so they didn't have the chair. They, we don't know what fabric they used. Uh, uh, will we ever know? Uh, I guess everybody wants to ever create it for themselves. You know? Well, I, Jason, <laughs> me find the chair, and I'd like to get the right fabric. No joke, no joke. <laughs> but you know, you talking about the museum, they are an invaluable resource when it comes to a lot of research. Anytime you have those that are dedicated to this type of work, you know, and you know, documentations and having it, and having it. So, I'm huge the fact that there's a <laughs> in the museum, it's, it's a high point to me. Yeah, it's, it's, it's happens. Right. It's, and yes. the fact that it, and the funny thing is, it's in 
that's in the visual soundtrack from the 90s. So there's the yeah, I visit, yeah, yeah. Yeah. they visit the museum in, in this 1991 visual soundtrack of the Japanese market. And they go to the museum, they have a picture of a, a spinning wheel that is was in this room with like historical you know, artifacts. And as they're in August for the you know, no they saw the same spinning wheel, like, oh my gosh, it's still here. And where was it going to go? I know, 30 years later. But the fact that it's in that room that's also in the need Local history becomes 20th history, becomes local history. Yeah, it's Yeah, it is. Uh, I think we can very well on one question. I only want to make sure that John can get next door. Yep. Um, I have one or two other questions I would do, um, but I don't allow the people to ask questions. Um, you touched on Twin Peaks a couple times. Um, that one's near and dear to my heart, and it's lost. Um, are there any things any of you would want to single out as a uh, a lost resource that you wish we still had, something we're not capturing effectively today that we need to capture, um, or, or just or, or just the general thoughts. John and I had a conversation with John, says, you know, my kids don't want to keep my collection. Vinny has asked me to put him in my will, because he wants my ice cream cones, um, and he probably has been asked for the chair. Um, uh, just thoughts on... You better watch your step. <laughs> yeah. Once that will is done. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, but just sort of thoughts on what, what we've lost or what we should be spending more time on, and then I, I'll, we'll do a chance to some questions. Well, I mean, I, my dream would be to have the actual production people, you know, that sort of stuff. And I know uh, there was stuff that was out there long ago. I remember in the, gosh, this one's been 2000, right? I did just going to eBay that year, and there was uh, three production Bibles. Yeah. That were, Ooh. I have pictures of them. Yeah. They were well, too much. They were, they were like, and I was uh, young, yeah. new career, you know, 20 something. And I was like, yeah, I don't have $3,000. You know, just to kind of spin off. But boy, I wish I did. Yeah. 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 Because it just would have helped answer a lot of questions that I'd probably been digging in and trying to find out. You're right. It is probably just a job or something. And it was like, you know, they were on to the next thing. The show was only 29, you know, 30 episodes for the first few seasons. You know, and again, we just don't have that. But it would help. It would probably help answer a lot of questions. It's supposedly an enormous amount of time. But, but I'm grateful, though, that we'll have Doc at least got us to a certain point. We might in from the Peaks or Brad Deuce's reflection. Right, or, right. You know, other other a role model. So, a rival, yeah. And the bigger views he did as well. For it's interesting you mentioned there's production Doc that's the price of them. I was here in 94 or 96, I can't remember. Bruce Phillips was here. Bruce oh, Phillips, the collector. Still He's still there. He's still there, He's still there. yeah. But at the time, he had connections with a lot of the people who worked in the production of the show. He was getting, and he had Laura's diary, the one that they pop open and they look at and it says nervous stuff. You know, he has the little, he still had the little bag, you know, taped in there. And, but what it had as well is if you flipped it, it had dialogue from the clock on and on. So they could look at it and read their lines as they were looking And that suddenly became more than a clock. And, uh, and he said it's five thousand dollars. And you know, like and somebody in Japan I didn't end up on I don't know where it is now. But if it was around for five thousand now, I'd be like, yeah, uh, exactly. Find a way <laughs> to, uh, to I, get that. I wanted to call out, forgot to, but so for those of you who attended the discussion yesterday about locals who went to filming, Melissa brought the signs that the crew use to find their way to the filming locations. And so she has two, and she said, I don't, I had one for my mom. I don't need my mom's a bonnet. And everyone in the room's like, when you're ready, you're at a second. <laughs> um, and I'm over there going, can I give one of those to the museum eventually? Yeah. 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 yeah I think that the people who work, you know, you talk about sources and that they're gone. There was a time when the people who worked on the show were accessible and they were open. They were, available to tell you a little bit about what happened behind the scenes or get you a prop or and you know unfortunately when the kid got older and they passed away or they had been told now right we can't speak anymore and there was an openness in the in the there was an openness uh, in the people who made the show that's not there as much as it used to be. The actors are more open now, they're so guarded. Mm -hmm. I didn't bother trying to interview anyone when I wrote my book about the Patronus because I talked to them uh, at conventions and stuff, but they, were just, they weren't going to say anything. They weren't going to talk to me. I'm like, well, there's no point putting an interview in, you know, really. And so um, we've lost that too. And it's possible as time passes and the 
the, the worry about the secrets fades away a little, some of those people will start to open up to us again because they are extremely bad. Well, you, you've talked to folks who were on the production. Yeah, well, that's on the topic of sources that I think we should be using more. I think the people behind the camera are mm -hmm. sort of a, an underutilized source of information. Because as wonderful as the actors are, and as generous as they are with their time doing events, uh, you know, the more times you tell a story, the more refined and embellished uh, and just sort of exciting, uh, designed to placate the crowd, that story becomes. And the crew doesn't have that song and dance to do. Uh, they were behind the camera doing pragmatic things and uh, pulling this all together uh, in a way uh, to where it was functional. And that's a different perspective that we don't get as often as we maybe should. And some of those people have, they have the most interesting stories. Like um, we talked to, to Jeff Moore this weekend, who was the prop master in the second season. Uh, Dave Robinson, who served as prop master for much of the first season and continued on as, as the, the lead painter throughout the rest of the series, uh, he's got great stories. I, I met up with him on the East Coast last year. Uh, Dave was, I don't know if you guys know, he was the Georgia Peach in the Georgia Peach photo. He's in a dress, on a bed, and a Polaroid picture. <laughs> that was the prop master. And if you go to the, the Twin Peaks wiki site, he's on a list of unknown characters. And he's known. He worked on the whole original series. And Firewalk with me. And Lost Highway. Those people have the story. Yes, we have. Those people. Yeah. Anybody have any questions for any of the panelists? I don't have a question, but... Um, you know, growing up, documented, unfortunately, I lost a ton of stuff. I lived in New Jersey, about two miles up out of New York City. Uh, three years ago, we had tenants that leave me the hours, and the town sewer system backed up. So I got three feet of water in my basement, and all my old Twin Peaks stuff gone. Uh, when I watched the original series, you know, I was dating a rich man already, so I videotaped each episode and had all the commercials. Rich commercials? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Please put it on YouTube. And then when he moved, <laughs> then when he moved the night, uh, to night, to Saturday nights, it was like three or four weeks that they didn't get it. And then back then, they could also order it. I had all the Twin Peaks gazettes. Uh -huh. And then uh, I also had uh, the t-shirts. It was... Uh, the crew t shirt citizen to post it all the time. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. I have, I have so right. Right. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Lost, yeah. so yeah. I lost a bunch of that. And as far as wrapped with plastic, I mean, that's just been super elusive for me. I, you know, every time I go to an antique store or any shop like that, I open for conventions, I always look for them. And the only one I've been out to find is one floor on the cover for Firewalk with me. So that's the only episode, I've, uh, issue I've ever seen. And, uh, you know, I'm still trying to find this, but I never see the Twin Peaks Gazettes. Uh, no. But the only thing that was salvaged from that original series is I have an original uh, sheriff that Martin Coffin up. Nice. Wait, and, and I think that's the important thing that I've been trying to do to the blog is provide a digital source for that. Yeah. And, you know, and trying to scan and just document those pieces, those, the art, and put that put together. I mean, there's a finite amount, right? Yeah. You know, like when it was originally produced. There's been other fan created things over the years. There's, you know, what, what we're trying to find those original things and being able to make those at least available for folks that want to be able to, to see that. And then I think the other, uh, I, I'm addicted now to some bombing balls postcards. I can't <laughs> find them, a lot of them. But it's interesting just to see the policies that did play such an important part of tourism here. I mean, Mount Rainier is like top, and then there's some about falls right? in terms of the most. In fact, even you at the Seattle airport, yes. you know, a big banner, <coughs> and it's a Mount Rainier, and it's Mount Rainier Falls. I'm like, wow, you know, so you know, people are coming to visit this. They're not Twin Peaks, but that's just an important part we, of history. We, when I uh, uh, went to King County, courthouse on Tuesday to give King County uh, Commission's proclamation for Twin Peaks Day. There is murals there at the bottom of the elevators and go around it. Oh, there's some holy balls. Yeah. And to me, I, I think the other piece that I'd love to be able to like, capture and have those those um, those items, gazettes, I got one of the physical copies. Yeah. 
yeah. uh, from being photos from this area. I still would love to find a way yep. that, because you know, everybody's not tweens, they've all taken the pictures out there, but I at least could be able to, to figure out when the, the banner that said Home of Twin Peaks Ties was no longer a banner of a big yep. team painted on, you know, like, just and be able to track through time. Um, yeah, we, we have to hold, have a whole other that's a whole panel about <laughs> digital art. Uh, because yeah. what happens to keep our sites alive after we're done? Uh, 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 but, but to your point, like, yeah. like, um, and and things like Facebook have created a bit of a wall garden now. And so, by going right Facebook groups, I well, Mary's moved away now, but Mary and I had a hobby of we would find ourselves in the background of other people's photos as I know. You know, and so it's like you want to, to get all this stuff together and track the changes for sure. And I think some of the ephemera pieces, those those documents, those papers, and all that kind of stuff, it's just you know, people don't keep those. Yeah. So just trying to have those documents saved somehow. Because um, somebody spent time putting it together or doing something like that or, or taking a picture of a post card. I know. So we're trying to trace that. Yep. Any other questions? I, when you're just saying like what the we the things that we're losing or whatever, I think about all the fish that slowly go away. And when we're always like, if everyone did a lot of it, we buy every two weeks. I, I, I really freely really admit to having a Zillow watch sat on all of the notable Twin Peaks houses. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I keep track when they sell, I keep track of how much they're selling for. Yeah. 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 Ye